Hey, David. Hey, what? How do you feel about the 1960s? I feel like they were many, many years ago. Like they were groovy. <laughs> How do you feel about 1960s cars? I mean, what's not to love about 1960s cars? 1967 Camaro, 1965 and a half Ford Mustang. I mean, there's just too many spectacular cars to name. Well, let's check some out. Let's do it. So cars of the 1960s, huh? Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Love cars. My beautiful bride here loves cars, and she definitely likes older cars. Yeah. Specifically, like your... Muscle cars. Muscle cars. Your... Except for a Mustang. Except for the I'm Mustang. a Camaro girl. Yes. Chevy all the way. Yes. I even have a tattoo for my car. Why don't you Her show... Her name's Baby. Why don't you show... Our friends, the cool tattoo. Is it going to be backwards? Probably. What's going to happen? There we go. There you go. There it is. It's a heartbeat gear shift pattern. That ending. matches my car exactly. Yep. With my little Chevy bow tie. <laughs> That's Boom. how much I love my car. Yes, indeed. All right, well, then let's see what other awesome cars there were in the 60s as well. Let's check it out. Or maybe it'll be not awesome cars. Who knows? It just says it's most popular cars popular from the cars, 1960s. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the I think the Gremlin was a popular car, but oh, that was not good. <laughs> not a good car at all. What about the car truck one? What was that called? Oh, the El Camino. Yeah. That wasn't a bad car. Is that 60s or 70s? Um, I think late 60s, maybe early 60s. You know what it is? It's the mullet of cars. The mullet of cars. <laughs> that was business in the front and party in the back. Heck yeah. <laughs> or was it party in the front and business in the back? I don't know. The 1960s heralded the rise of what's known as the Big Three, the trio of vehicle manufacturers comprised of Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors. <laughs> Together, along with several other American brands, these manufacturers dominated the market. Economy, luxury, and power-hungry muscle cars flooded the market as the American car industry boomed. In this video, we're going to take a little trip down memory lane and look at some of the elegant, innovative, and sporty cars from the 1960s. Facts First presents the most popular cars from the 60s. Did you own one? No. Ford Mustang. As far as sports cars go, the Mustang arguably made the most significant impact when it debuted in the 60s. It was first shown off at the New York World Fair in 1964, and the Mustang line has continued to adapt to the ever-changing demands and desires of the sports car market. Car lovers everywhere immediately fell in love with the long hooded and short decked silhouette of this iconic vehicle. It was also desirable because of how it offered consumers a ton of power and performance at a relatively affordable price. Ford could barely keep the Mustang in stock. Demand was through the roof. Initially, Ford expected to move more than 100,000 units in its first year, but within three months, they had already met that target. By the end of the decade, Ford had produced more than 2 million Mustangs. Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow Rolls-Royce defined what a luxury vehicle could be when they introduced their Silver Shadow in 1965. Its name alone is something to marvel at, but beyond nomenclature, it featured a hydro-pneumatic rear suspension system, much like the one featured in the Citroen DS. The Silver Shadow also boasted groundbreaking features like electric adjustable seats and split-level air conditioning. Underneath the hood, the Silver Shadow was equipped... Doesn't that look like something out of um, The Godfather? Yeah. <laughs> One of those Corleones that was driving it. For sure. <laughs> With a 172 horsepower, 6.2 liter V8 engine that was more than capable of accelerating its 4,600 pound body without needing to be ear piercingly loud. By 1980, when production of the model ended, Rolls Royce had produced and sold more than 28,000 units despite its hefty $70,000 price tag. Wow. Alpine. 70,000 back then, that's like 200,000 now. 
That's a lot. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of bones. <laughs> An A110. This beautiful, lightweight, rear-engine sports car performed like a dream, both on and off the road. It weighed just a little under 1,600 pounds, and thanks to its inline four-cylinder engine, it was capable of putting out almost 140 horsepower. Since all that power was strapped to its rear, this iconic French sports car liked to... I've got a lot of power strapped to my rear. <laughs> you see what I have to deal with, people? <laughs> It's a joy every day. Do you remember this car? I mean, I remember reading about it, but it's a French car, so didn't spend much. I don't think I've ever seen one in real life. Swing its tail around turns like an uber excited dog. The Alpine A110 featured a fiberglass body, which made it especially lightweight and nimble. In 1973 alone, it won six WRC events, proving it was a force to be reckoned with. In 2017, the Alpine was revived, and honestly, it's everything that it was back in its heyday. Perhaps more. Datsun 240Z. Before Nissan took over the category, Datsun was the original creator of the fan favorite Z division of sports cars. The 240Z boasted a 2.4 liter inline six engine and used every bit of its 150 horsepower to maximum potential. By I rebuilt the 280Z. I was gonna say my brother's first car was the 280Z, but we lived in upstate New York and that thing was rusted through the floorboard. Rust bucket. It was not in good shape at all. It was in terrible shape. I, the one that I feel like he must have looked at it in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he bought that. The one that we rebuilt. Oh, excuse me. Edit that out. <laughs> the one that we rebuilt, uh, it was blue. I remember that. Oh, my brother's was blue, too. Um, and it was not rusted out. <laughs> 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 it, it spent its time in Southern California and Arizona. Oh. There we go. Well, that, that's a good place for it. Yeah. Bills was not sending it through a five speed stick shift to the rear wheels. While it wasn't remarkably fast, it did have a decent 125 mile per hour top speed and could go from zero to 60 in just under eight yeah, seconds. Pretty. Chevrolet Camaro. The Camaro was GM's answer to their rival Ford's Mustang, which was booming in popularity at the time. But don't think the Camaro was just some kind of quick-to-the-market reactionary copycat. It was a unique beast that held its own. The first Camaros were essentially clones of the Chevy Nova, borrowing several of the Nova's mechanical designs and parts. The car hit the lot in 1966, and by the end of the year, it had sold more than 220,000 units. That's even more impressive when you consider how the Mustang sold approximately 480,000 the same year. Throughout its history, the Camaro's popularity continued to skyrocket, partly because racing enthusiasts had taken quite a liking to it. By the end of the 60s, it became one of the most popular vehicles on the market. Yeah! Ford Bronco. This iconic vehicle was initially conceived as an alternative to rival offerings like the Jeep CJ and the Harvester Scout. Banking on the success of the Mustang, the Bronco rolled into lots across America beginning in 1966. Folks had a choice of three models. You could get it as a wagon, pickup, or roadster, all of which featured a two-door layout. The first Broncos were manuals, and their transitions were made to either inline six or V8 engines. So, my brother's first job, which was very brief, and he only had it because my parents made him do it, was on a farm. We're upstate New York, a lot of farms. It was mm -hmm. on a farm, and we'd go pick him up, and he stunk so bad. And I don't know how I got trapped into this, but we got thrown into the very back. And there was, like, a divider between the back and the, the front seats. So we were, like, in the bed, the back of this Bronco. And it, oh, I had to sit there with my brother smelling like cow crap. The nice. whole ride home. <laughs> That's my memory of our Ford Bronco. <laughs> Where you go, Bill? <laughs> Stinking her out. Oh, he didn't even last that long at that job. <laughs> it was too much manual labor. <laughs> depending on the model. The Bronco's popularity continued to increase, and today it's considered to be one of the manufacturer's most iconic offerings. <laughs> Buick Riviera. Buick's iconic luxury coupe set out to conquer a segment of the market that previously was dominated by Ford's Thunderbird. 
The vehicle featured distinct design aesthetics that made it instantaneously identifiable, including its prominent egg crate grille and a series of creased lines that ran along the rear and front quarters of its body. The Riviera's interior was also quite extravagant. Because of this and its powerful performance, the public began to take notice of this new entry into the luxury car market and began buying up all of Buick's stock. Dealerships struggled to keep the Riviera in stock throughout its run, which lasted from 1963 to 65. More than 100 and 12,000 Rivieras were sold. Ford Thunderbird. This snazzy sports car was the most popular luxury coupe of the decade. It held this distinct honor virtually unchallenged until the unveiling of the Buick Riviera. Production started in 57, but Ford made a few tweaks to its design in 1960. All of these changes, for the most part, were cosmetic. Perhaps the most noteworthy was the addition of a third taillight. 1960 was a record-breaking year for the T-Bird, as Ford moved an astonishing 92,000 units. As the decade continued, Ford implemented several other modifications to the car. By 1969, three more Thunderbird iterations were introduced to the market. Like the grill, but those lights flipped up. There, um, there must be some kind of a T-Bird club around here, because remember we went to a vintage store, huge store in downtown Chandler. And um, there are a bunch of those T-Birds lined up right outside of it. They were having some some kind of a meet. Yeah. It was pretty neat, though. Yeah. That's cool to look at. VW Beetle. This iconic vehicle has a spellbinding history, although that's not surprising considering it was in production from 1938 until 2003. The most famous incarnation, the Type 1, sold more than 21 million units. The tiny yet surprisingly agile car was fun to drive, fairly affordable, and quite reliable. The Beetle helped pave the way for Volkswagen to offer consumers more expensive luxury cars under its Audi brand, which they took over in 1965. The original Bug was made in Mexico, and while it's been discontinued since 2003, there are rumors floating around that the Beetle might be coming back in the near future as an electric vehicle. Probably. BMC Mini. If you thought the Mercedes-Benz smart car was the first tiny car, you must not have been alive during the 60s. The British Motor Corporation started producing this incredibly popular car in the early 60s, and it became a defining icon of British pop culture. The Mini helped define its era. It featured a front-wheel drive layout and space-saving transverse engine, and the combo of these features allowed for 80% of the interior usable for luggage and passengers. In 1999, the Global Automotive Elections Foundation reported that the Mini was voted as the second second most influential car of the 1900s, outvoted only by the Model T. The Mini was designed by revered British automobile designer Sir Alec Isigonis, and it was produced at various plants all over the world. From 1959 to 2000, the Mini went through four different marks or generations. By 2000, when the Mini's production was halted, it had sold close to 5.5 million units worldwide. Pontiac GTO. With the introduction of the GTO in 1964, Pontiac tossed a bunch of gasoline onto the blazing muscle car craze that had swept across the U.S. It remained a popular choice for muscle car buffs throughout the decade and well into the following one. The GTO's name was inspired by Ferrari. It was actually presented as an options package for Pontiac's Le Mans, although it quickly caught on with the public and evolved into a full-on separate model. By placing greater emphasis on power and performance with its V8 engine, Pontiac could offer customers a car capable of churning out 325 horsepower at 4,800 rotations per minute. Dodge Charger. The first incarnation of the Charger was presented at an auto show in 1964. Two years later, it entered into production. At first, the Charger, which was based on Dodge's Coronet, failed to sell. But Dodge decided to keep it alive while making a series of much-needed changes. In 1968, everything changed. No longer was the Charger struggling to stay afloat, but in fact, it quickly became one of the most sought-after vehicles on the market. Dodge initially intended to produce 35,000 units, but they tripled that number to keep up with the sudden influx. What's the look on that guy's face? Mm, I have to die. I don't know if he's like smug or... <laughs> it's a badass car, though. Like the charger. Sales. Now it's time to hear from you. Did you ever own one of these cars? Which one of these is your favorite? Let us know in the comments section. Hey, that's a Ferrari. So, I'm actually on my second Camaro. Yep. So, Two I had... generations of Camaro. Yeah, I had, what, the fourth generation, and now I have the fifth generation. So, um... You just need to get the it. sixth, and then work your way back. Right. I, I love every generation of the Camaro. I think they are all beautiful in their own way. Each one still holds something that represents 
the Camaro. You can look at it. You know it's a Camaro. Uh, I just, I freaking love that car. It's my favorite. What about you? Was there any in there that? Thunderbird. Yeah. Yeah. Love the Thunderbird. I'd say the Mustang too, but then you'll kick me underneath the table. So then you'll be Not sleeping good. on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the reason, I mean, the, I had a Mustang. I, me and my buddy re, rebuilt a 65 Mustang. Um, I mean, it holds some sentimental value in that regard. But in terms of the cars, the Thunderbird and the GTO, I mean, it's just. Yeah. The GTO is nice. Classic. That yeah. um, charger was sweet. Love those. Yeah, the um, my first car was a Ford, and it broke down on the way home. So that She's was been angry ever since. <laughs> I hold grudges, so I have never had and will never buy another Ford. I'm worried that if I break down, she's gonna hold that against me for the rest. Of it. <laughs> it could happen. You never know. All hey. right, guys. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Did you have any of those cars? Did you like any of those cars? Or are you wanting to get any of those cars? Comment down below. Let us know. But before you go, make sure that you subscribe. Like. Share. You already said comment, so I'm going to say ring the little bell. And comment down below. <laughs> Again. <laughs> or you could also visit, visit us on our Savage Reactions Facebook page. We'd love to see you over there, too. Until next time. Peace. Rock on.